This Week in Startups is brought to you by HostGator, your one-stop shop to getting your business online. Your domain name, your website, your website design, and even your marketing. They've got you covered. Have questions? Their team is there 24-7 via chat, phone, and email to help you. Start today for 30% off with coupon code TWIST. And Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. From the Launch Incubator series, Matt Epstein, the first employee of Zenefits and now VP of Marketing, opens his playbook to explain how the SaaS powerhouse achieved maximum growth over the last three years. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like me. Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you Hey guys, Michael, thanks for, thanks for sticking around um, So I am VP of Marketing at Zenefits and, and we're quickly becoming notorious for our growth Not just in Headcount, which I'll share those numbers in a minute, but also just in revenue. And as the first employee uh, at Zenefits, I can tell you for three years, all I've done is le- uh, basically breathed, eaten, slept, cried, uh, growth. Um, and so, you know, when you guys were showing your presentations, I can tell you what, what VCs look for, you know, whether you're on your C or your A or your B, um, you know, we just, we just did a, a half a half a billion dollar um, B. They look for the hockey stick, whether that's users for something like Crux um, or, or, or revenue uh, for something like Scout. <clears throat> and, and that needs to never stop, right? That's, they're, they're investing in that to see that 10x over whatever period of time. And so there, there is, other than figuring out your product and making sure there's market fit, there's literally nothing you should be doing other than making sure you are getting that, that, that hockey stick that hockey stick growth. And so I'm basically going to give you our playbook and actually tell you what, what we did to do that. Um, it, we, for context, we're a B2B SaaS company, so I'm not sure this applies to everyone, but I'm definitely sure there's lessons that, that you know, all of you guys can take away from this. Um, so to give you a little insight into what, what I've done and I think what our company's done, just because I think it adds a little bit of credibility to what I'm about to tell you, from a revenue perspective, uh, we've essentially gone from a little over, let's say, been around for about two and a half years now, and we've gone from approximately zero dollars in revenue uh, to uh, over 21 million this year, and, and hopefully on track this year to go from 21 to 100. And so, if this were a pissing match, which it's not, but I like winning pissing matches, uh, we would essentially be, you know, essentially one of the fastest growing SaaS companies ever. And in terms of headcount, you know, I started out in, in Parker's Kitchen, went to the, the Phil's out on mission, if any of you've ever been there. Uh, that's, that's where we moved out of the kitchen. And <clears throat> once we got seven to eight people, Phil's started kicking us out because they didn't like us taking up the whole Phil's coffee. So eventually got that little five person office out in mission, or uh, excuse me, uh, 10, 20 person office out in mission. And now today we are uh, about 12, about 1200 people, I think, a little over 1200 people. So. Going from you know me to to and two founders to twelve hundred people in two and a half years is just something you kind of have kind of have to be through to get it. But it's a lot of people, a lot of growth. Um, and so the playbook for that is is really uh, four things. Um, first thing you need to do is figure out how to package and sell your product. So this is kind of what Jason's doing with you guys with this pitch. This is this is definitely part of it. And then once you know how to package it, you know how to pitch it, you know, you know how to get the product market fit, you know how to sell it, then you need to scale it. And, and you need to do that with machines, which I'll explain why. And then after that, you need to start doing that with, with humans. Um, you know, if you're a B2C company, you're probably not gonna have like a large sales force, but if you are a B2B company or you, you sell to anything other than, you know, the million consumers, uh, then you are gonna end up needing humans. And the last thing is just how do you do everything you possibly can after that to, to get growth. <clears throat> and so, Play one of, of the playbook is you need to find your special sauce. So what goes into your special sauce? So there's essentially three things. There's your messaging. So what, what are you telling people 
that that's really getting them compelled. Like, oh, I freaking, I freaking hate that. I wish there was a solution for that. And doing it in a way that I think I mentioned this to someone earlier. If you were at a bar with your friend, how would you explain it to them in in twenty seconds as a friend and have them be like, that is a that like I need that. And then your audience. So who does this who does this thing like really actually appeal to? Um, it could be a CFO, it could be a CEO. What happens when you actually do this test? You end up finding there may be a market you didn't even like realize was a market, or I was talking to the wrong person the whole time. And then the third thing is where do you get your lead sources? So like wired in is 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 where you go, I guess. <laughs> um, and and so this is actually a lot less ambiguous than you'd think. There's actually there's actually a very real way to figure out your secret sauce. Um, I could I could promise you, you know, McDonald's did not figure out the Big Mac um, just one day like under an apple tree and an apple hit their head and they're like, oh, that would I like I know the secret sauce. So how how you can actually figure this out is believe it or not what I did. Um, so you know when when uh, I asked Parker to help get his first thirty customers, all I did for the first three months was I A/B tested. Um, emails. I would I would send out you know 50, 50 emails a day in my network, and I do I did that for months. I was literally in my boxers in my bed eating, oddly enough, McDonald's every day because I this is all I was doing for like eighteen hours a day, testing like little tiny word changes, big entire you know pitch changes until finally I actually noticed well well when I say it like this I'm getting like an astronomically higher response. And, and that's when I knew like this is this is kind of how you package and sell this thing. And then after that, I started going, okay, now, like intuitively, I thought, oh, it's 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 you know, it's the HR person who buys this, right? We have like HR software. Intuitively, it's HR people. Well, I, I tested this message this message on finance, on operations, on this the founder, on <clears throat> probably even went to like the janitor for all I know. And what I realized is actually the HR people were, were less responsive. It was actually the CEOs and the CFOs and the CEOs who were more responsive. Um, so then I had, then I said, okay, you know, I understood the message. I understood like who, who really to go after. And then the third thing is, well, where, where do I find those people? So how, you know, it's great that I was able to talk to one person, but now if I was ever to have a 500 person sales team, how would I talk to an audience this large? <clears throat> and so, you guys can do this, and I highly, highly recommend you all do this. Um, you all go through the exercise of manually emailing. What this, what this did for us is it literally shaped how we did everything. I mean, all of our, I mean, all of our, all of our, our website, all of our sales collateral, our entire sales pitch, all came from this three-month exercise. And if you really want to see something funny, all of our competitors. When we started, it was I, I dumbed it down into payroll, benefits, HR, all online, all in one place. N super boring, not sexy at all, but it like it it, it, and it just worked huge. And I even AdWords tested it to see like what ad would actually get the highest click through rate. <clears throat> and it was just like 10x everything else. And you'll actually notice if you go back in the way back time machine, all of our competitors now. It's all like payroll benefits HR, payroll benefits HR. I mean, they, they literally shifted to this message just thinking like, well, this, this must be the successful message. But like, guess what? We got to it first and we owned it and it's because we did this. Um, so if any of you guys aren't like really sure how, I mean, even if you think you're sure, you should still do this because like what this has that, I guarantee, that you probably ha don't have yet is data. Data that actually shows this is like the right way to sell it. Hey everybody, let me stop for a moment and tell you about HostGator. You can stop thinking about the business you want to do and you can just do it. The first step is web hosting and a domain name from our friends at HostGator.com. It's a one-stop shop for your online business. You can set up WordPress, drag and drop builders, easily set up custom email addresses. They have in-house design, SEO, and PPC pay-per-click services. So as you grow, you'll be able to easily transfer from your $4 a month shared hosting account and you'll have dedicated services, VPS, all that great stuff, 24-7, 365 day a year, live support via chat, phone, or email. We love them so much that Twist is hosted with them. That's right, it's super affordable compared to things like Amazon. They have reliable service, um, and we've had a really great experience with them. It's super quick to get set up, and everything is clearly explained um, and very nice and neat with screenshots and everything. The first 100 Twist listeners that sign up with the promo code TWIST25 will receive one year of HostGator hosting package for just $25. That's right, TWIST25, and you will receive the one year of the HostGator hatchling package for just $25. 
This includes tons of disk space, unmetered bandwidth, MySQL databases, and multiple custom email accounts. So don't worry, if you're not one of the first 100, you can still save 30% using the promo code TWIST. Thanks again to our friends at HostGator for hosting This Week in Startups.com and for providing all this great service to our listeners. Go ahead and thank at HostGator on your Twitter handle. Okay, thanks again, HostGator. Let's get back to this amazing program. Then the next step is, is scaling it with machines. So, okay, I like, in, you know, me in my, in my bed eating McDonald's is probably not like a very scalable way to run a business. So what you want to do is you want to start scaling with mach machines. So uh, what most people do is they start a, a company in Silicon Valley and they, they get Marketo set up and Salesforce set up and these giant enterprise systems to help scale. And it's always the wrong move. A, they're super expensive. Um, B, they're in, it, it requires like an operator just to use the freaking things. They're great systems, but they're not what you need when you're a three, five person shop trying to be nimble. <clears throat> and there's solutions out there that get the, jump, the, the job done way faster. So you want to start with, uh, for CRM, I recommend Clozio. So this is how you stay on top of your leads, making sure you know, you're not forgetting the guy that, that you spoke to three months ago. <clears throat> and then something like a Gmail MailChimp just for email. Um, and then what you, what you want to move towards is basically getting away from you know, one to one to batch, and then from like all these manual workflows to you know, automation. So when someone emails in, you know, someone requests a demo, just automatically emails go out saying like, hey, I'm John, would love to talk, even though you know didn't come out from a person. <laughs> and then the nice thing about that, this is three, six, 12 months, when you are ready to really go big, now guess what, you understand your funnel end to end, you know exactly what the sales process looks like, you know exactly what your automation will look like, and you're setting Salesforce and Marketo up the right way from day one, which I can tell you, who here has worked at a company that used Salesforce? How was the Salesforce instance? Was it enjoyable? Yeah. Like, I, I, I've almost met no one who likes the Salesforce system at their work, and it's because it's literally like, they started it in the beginning 10 years ago, and it's just like, the shit was piled on top of it and like band-aids and taped together. And it, it literally like makes your business run slower because it's the foundation of your business. Um, and it, that was actually, it sounds silly, but not going on a big system like that in the beginning was a, a really uh, big help for us. So now that you have, you know, now that you've kind of, uh, let me go back to this for a second. Now that you've scaled with machines, what that does is, is you know, you're doing things in larger volumes, and now, now you have repeatable SaaS metrics. Um, now, now you have like some sort of baseline that for every X, I get X out, and that's really the point when you have you know repeatable SaaS, SaaS metrics that make sense in a business model. That's that's when you go to you know in B two B, it's usually sales development reps or or you know mixed account account executives who are also uh, sales development reps. And you do it when you have your special sauce, because now you know what these people need to be saying to get the deal. Uh, you've proven it scales, because you, you've done something. The thing that machines are that humans aren't is machines are predictable, um, they're efficient, they're cost effective, humans are not. So if you can't make it work with a machine, like let me tell you, you're not gonna make it work with humans, I like guarantee you. <clears throat> and then you have baseline numbers to compare to, right? So for every X I sent out, I got X in. This, this SDR is only doing like one demo a month. Um, and so what, what a good outbound SDR looks like, and there's definitely some of you guys who I think will have business models where you have either prospectors or closer prospectors. <clears throat> you want about 35 sales qualified leads a month, um, 18 to 30 opportunities. So a qualified lead is just someone who meets your qualifications, an opportunity is someone who like, there's actually a chance in hell of this deal closing. Um, and you want about 60 to 75% conversion rates on, on their opportunities. Um, excuse me, from demo to opportunity. And it usually, it takes about two to three months to ramp if it's like more transactional in nature. Um, and so if, if you ever think you'll need SDRs, you'll wanna write these numbers down because uh, it took us a long time to actually figure this out. <laughs> and now you have like kind of a good baseline of what, what, it, what success looks like. <clears throat> so after that, now that you have the humans, in you have the machines in place, you have the humans in place, after that, just pull every freaking lever you can pull, 
because let me tell you, the bigger you get, the harder that hockey stick gets to keep up. Um, and 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 VCs don't, and the public markets don't like high five you for like, well, you d- you did good these last three years. We'll give you like a pass on the next year. Like Apple, Apple will do like a billion a quarter, and instead of doing one point two billion, they only do one point one billion, and like their 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 stock slides like five <laughs> percent. You know what I mean? It's like no one no one gives kudos for 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 for, for not growing. Um, and so that's really when you just need to do everything you possibly can. So what is your starting lineup? So for most of you guys, like how many people have more than five people on their team? A few of you? Okay, more than 10? Okay, how many of you have a VP of marketing or just a marketing guy? Only one. How many people have a growth guy? Only one. So very quickly, you're gonna realize you need a hockey stick and so the very first person you're going to want on your team is the guy who's going to help you figure out the hockey stick. Um, and this is like a Swiss army knife. This is a guy <coughs> who, who can just get shit done and figure out how to get uh, a demand in the door. Now, this is not, this is not a salesperson because salespeople close stuff. You want a guy who generates demand. After that, you want account executives to close your stuff. So for like the first five months, six months, I was the first sales guy. Like me and Parker were the first salespeople. We were, I was the first demand generator and Parker was the first salesperson and I was the second salesperson. So eventually you, you need someone besides you know, the founder to be closing deals. And then after that, you really want SDRs who can you know, kind of grow the demand. And then lastly, you want a, 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 a someone to run marketing ops. And I'll, I'll kind of explain why that's so important, but <clears throat> the guy doing the machines and the scaling and all the operations, it's that guy. Um, and it's a full-time job and it's a very complicated job. So VP of marketing, what do you, what do you want to look for? Um, this is the guy who, who is packaging and selling and finding your secret sauce. He's the one who, you win Parker for three years, all is Parker. All, the only thing that Parker's ever said to me is, are we doing you know, 30% more opportunities this month than last month? And my answer always has to be yes. Um, and so the qualities are down there, I won't walk through them, but I, I, I think this is important because what, what people really struggle with often when they look for this is like, how do I know, how do I know if this guy's good or not? Um, and I think like a very easy litmus test to understand if you're hiring the right growth guy for your team is to ask a few of these questions. So the, the biggest giveaway is buzzwords. If you have ever, you know, I like, I'm, I'm like more of like a brand strategy guy and you know, I really, you know, I really, I just like to really think strategic. Like, you know what that guy's telling you? I don't know how to do anything technical. <laughs> like I will, I will sit there and add no value because I will have to like hire consultants and contractors and outsource parties. Um, so ways to figure out if, if, if he's not this guy is, is, you know, what are the first things you do to generate demand? Um, and if, 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 if like his ideas sound sound super unscalable and just slow and like I'll, I'll hit my hockey stick in three years and you know it's not the guy. Like I think the first thing we should do is events. Well really, I mean, unless you're an enterprise selling to Fortune 100, you'll hit a hockey stick in like three years after like you're done with your events. Um, another, this is probably my favorite, what's your most creative marketing hack? So almost in any role I ask this question because it, it's such a good indicator of creativity is not uh, you know, just I think Michael's role where, where you're like a, a great singer um, or a great painter. <clears throat> like creativity can be a football player who, who, who like, you know, is, a, is an amazing running back. Creativity is, could be an accountant who, who, who's like a magician with the numbers. Same thing goes for marketing. If someone, you know, I have done some crazy shit in three years. Um, I, won't, I won't go into most of them. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've, I've had, I've had I, I mean, I was contemplating sending basically like sending cupcakes to like 10,000 people with with like a handwritten note just to see if like people would respond to the cupcake that's not that's not the most creative idea but my point is people will if people can tell you something besides like ppc or sem or email then the odds are they'll find they'll just find a way to get it done like that's what creativity is about is is you you, you the ability to think outside the box um and the 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 other question i really like um is pitch me your last company, or you know what, what's your favorite thing, your favorite product? Well, pitch that to me like I didn't know what it was and you wanted me to use it. And a great marketing, great demand person is also an amazing salesperson. Like I said, I, I sold the first 50 something percent of our customers because this guy, when he writes all the emails, when he does the website, when he does all the collateral, if, if he can't sell people, then everything he pumps out is not gonna sell people. Um, 
And so that's kind of my thoughts on how you weed out the bad versus the good. Account executives, I really have no freaking clue. <laughs> so that's our VP of sales, Sam Blonde. Um, really amazing sales leader. You should really ask him what makes a good sales rep because I got no clue. Um, and then VP of marketing ops. Uh, so this guy is essentially the one, he, he's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, the guy behind the curtain, like pulling all the levers. Um, he does all your sales force, your Marketo, your, your attribution, your email campaigns. Um, and this stuff becomes incredibly important early on. I think he was like our 10th or 11th hire, so something very early like that. Um, and now invaluable. So, so, you know, good ways to weed this guy out is tell me everything you know about canned spam. Um, most people actually don't really know the rules of canned spam. Um, but if, if, you, if you're in the, you know, Jeremy at his last job was sending like 20, email, 20 million emails a week, he knows canned spam. Um, and anyone who does email campaigns knows it. What would you put into your lead score? So, you know, how, how, how do you think about all of the things that go into a lead? Like, like walk me through that process. And, and most people will do something very boring. Well, they visited the website and like downloaded a white paper. Like, like that, that's, not, that's not very creative. Um, and probably the most, the most interesting one is, is actually, has anyone ever done marketing automation here? Okay, so you know, so for those of you who have, you understand how like marketing logic works. It's like basically a bunch of if, if or statements. So like if active customer do this and you know. <clears throat> so you wanna give them whatever your product is, you wanna basically say, okay, I wanna hit these people with my product. What, what would like, what would like the, if, if you were gonna replace a human with a machine, what would the logic look behind that? Like how would you make this machine act like a human? Um, and it's fascinating to see people go through this exercise because they either crumble, um, you know, like a, like, like a sandcastle uh, or, or they just, they, uh, um, I'm trying to think of that movie. What's the one with Russell Crowe? A Beautiful Mind It, right? And next thing you know, they've just got like post-its everywhere and they've like replaced humans with machines. <clears throat> um, and then there's SDRs, BDRs. So these are the guys, if you're fortunate enough to have a business model where you can actually separate your, your prospecting from your closing, um, you'll end up with SDRs. So like Salesforce has like 500 or something SDRs. Box has hundreds of SDRs. All these big B2B SaaS companies have SDRs. Um, so there's inbound, they're the ticket takers, are the people like requesting demos on your site, then there's outbound, those are the people cold calling. Um, and so <clears throat> like how do, you, how do you weed out your bad guys from your good guys? Um, and by the way, the reason why I think this is so important for you guys is because when you're early on, the people on your, like what makes your company is your people when you're the first five, 10, 20 people. And if there is like a single weak link, you're pretty much, you're pretty much screwed. Um, because by the time you find the person you really want, you just lost like three to four months in hiring. Um, and so for a good SDR, I think it's the same thing as the marketing person, which is they could be right out of college, but hey, what, what do you love most? Pinterest, great. Well, what is Pinterest? Why would I use it? Um, and they'll be able to sell you if, if they're just like inherently good at sales. <clears throat> Hammer them on their previous numbers from their last jobs. Good salespeople know their, their numbers inside out. And then try and make them crack under pressure. So my favorite thing, I like, I don't really interview as much anymore, but I loved interviewing because I loved making people crack under pressure. Um, and they either like, they, they're either like a stone and a rock and they just power through it, or again, they just get like super flustered and just kind of like melt in front of you, which is always unfortunate, but it's, it's you know, it saves you, a, <laughs> saves you a lot of time in the interview. Let's just put it that way. Um, and then a take home writing test. Um, so the ability for people to sell in writing kind of gives you a good litmus for, you know, if they were gonna sell over the phone. Hey everybody, hey everybody, let me stop for a moment this amazing episode and tell you about the Walker Corporate Law Group. Yes, they are a boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs and startups. And Scott Walker is the founder of that company and he is a personal friend of mine and he does a great job working with startups. I have literally introduced him to dozens, maybe hundreds now of startups and they all rave about the services of the Walker Corporate Law Group because their lawyers have decades of experience. You're not going to get junior associates who are getting on the job training with your startup. No, they're going to help you with mergers and acquisitions, licensing, terms of service, privacy policies, formation, all this kind of stuff, fundraising. And they're really great at it. And they do fixed fees. They don't want to surprise people with crazy, crazy bills. They think that billable hours can reward inefficiency. So they'll just be fair with you. And that's what I love about them. Because if you're a startup, you don't want to get that sticker shock and get a huge, huge bill. 
make sure you use the Walker Corporate Law Group. And you can do that by calling Scott Walker at 415-979-9998. 415-979-9998. You can email him, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, or you can visit walkercorporatelaw.com as well. Scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. And let Scott Ed Walker on Twitter know, at Scott Ed Walker, know that you, hey, you watch the program and you appreciate him supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. One of my oldest advertisers, one of my oldest friends in the industry, just a great guy, a total mensch, and he really takes care of the startups who work with him. Thank you, Scott Walker, for supporting This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Okay, let's get back to this program. Come on. The last thing I want to show, share with you, I actually just gave a speech on this at uh, 500 Startups, was our five biggest fuck-ups. Um, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping you guys can learn from my fuck-ups so you don't fuck up, because fucking up is not fun. So the first thing is uh, don't let your limitations limit you. So oftentimes when you go into, you know, uh, when you go into demand gen, you, you oftentimes stop yourself from doing something because you say to yourself, that's too expensive, that doesn't scale. Um, like obviously me and my underwear sending out individual emails is like not scalable. Uh, we've done a lot of other things that are inherently not scale scalable, but with enough, in basically with enough time, money, and ingenuity, we've been able to scale them. But had I, in the beginning, just like immediately shut myself off and say like, there's no way I can send 10,000 cupcakes, right? Like, that's just too expensive. Or I don't even, like I can't, I can't order that many cupcakes. <clears throat> if it works, just do it to see if it works. And if it works, you'll find a, you'll, you will find a way to scale it. Um, you'll buy tinier cupcakes. You'll, you'll open up like, you know, your own, you'll, you'll hire 20 task rabbits and, and produce your own cupcakes. Like you will find a way to make it scale. But always try, um, when, you, when you're talking about demand, just, just don't, don't worry about like what's limiting you. Just do whatever you think would work um, and then try and get it to work and then worry about the scaling later. Dream, so like the biggest mistake I made uh, was listening to my team. Um, you should never listen to each other. Like the biggest mistake people make is listening to what other people say because the only thing you should listen to is data. Um, you should always begin and end a conversation in data because what happens is people get these gut feelings and, and like, you know, there's 10 email responses and they're all high five and this, this worked, this was awesome. And it's like, dude, we sent out 100,000 emails. <laughs> it's like a .00002 response rate. It's not that awesome. Um, and I have fallen into this trap so many times. Um, so whatever you're doing, just always make sure you're looking at the underlying data because it, it often tells a different story than, than peop what people just kind of think and gut feel. Um, the other thing is stretch goals and the goal. So like who, I don't know, I don't know if we want to share revenue goals, but whatever your revenue goal is, you should just basically like 10x that. Um, like my favorite, my favorite example, A, because stretch goals, people ignore stretch goals. Um, first off, they don't actually take them seriously. Because uh, you know what they do? Your, let's say your goal is a million, your stretch goal is five million. They hit a million and they're like, didn't hit our stretch goal, but we hit our goal. It's like pretty, pretty good day. You know, not, 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 a, not a bad time. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I noticed is that when, when you set a goal, people often fall just above or just below that goal. So if you set you know, a, a million dollar goal, very strong odds you'll, you'll fall a little bit below above or that. Whereas you set a five million goal, even if you fall way short and hit three million, still going to be better than your million. Um, so very early on, when we were only at like a few hundred thousand in revenue, Parker comes in one day, this is like the beginning of the year, and he says, Matt, I want to I wanna go you know, from basically nothing to 10 million. <clears throat> and Sam and I were like, whoa, that's it's like pretty, cr j just for context, that's pretty fast. <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to get to your first few million, um, let alone 10 million. And I was like, okay, I think I can do this. And then he comes in literally the next morning and goes, I changed my mind, I want to do 20 million. <clears throat> and I literally flipped my shit. I yelled, I cried, I stamped my feet. I, I like threatened to quit. Um, it was it was like super ugly. And I, and I was like, this is the stretch goal, right? He's like, no, this is like, this is the goal. Um, and what that forced me to do after after like Parker, like, you know, calmed me down um, and and like convinced me not to quit. Um, he said, OK, well, in a world of which you could hit 20 million, what what would that take? <clears throat> and I was like really grumpy. I was like, well, I guess I guess I need like three SDRs and I need email. I need this. I need that. And all of a sudden he goes, great, do that. And now I was like, holy shit. Right. I just I, I two seconds ago, this was like an impossible feat. And now all of a sudden I just basically convinced myself that I can do this. 
<clears throat> and and what what basically making the goal, what making the stretch goal the real goal does, is it forces you to like literally think in ways you never thought. Um, and and it 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 you will you will think outside of the box. Um, and and there's really no other way to do that other than to set a goal for yourself that's nearly nearly impossible. Um, so I'm just actually curious, how many of you guys would think you've set a goal for yourself that that's like nearly impossible? So two of you guys, Jason. The launch festival. The launch <laughs> what is it? Well, I told everybody we wanted to break ten, and then I said twelve thousand people, and then I said next year we'll have twenty-five thousand people, which is impossible because there's no venue that can fit us. <laughs> <laughs> you, now we're trying to figure out what venue can fit us for how. But that's awesome, and 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 not only will he, you know he might hit it, but even if he falls short, it's still a ridiculous number. I mean, this a mo two months ago, I, we're doing our first our first event. It's a road show. I told Parker I think we could do fifty people, <clears throat> and Parker was like, "That's bullshit. Like you're doing you're doing you're doing one hundred and fifty. There's like no." There's just like, sorry, like no questions about it. And I did the exact same thing. I kind of like pouted and went back to my desk and was like, that's impossible. Um, and, and our smallest city already has like over 500 registrations. Um, and it's because I had to figure out how the hell do I get this many people into one room that's actually qualified. Um, so I think that's an important lesson just as founders because it's something you, you end up doing for your entire team. It could be engineering, it could be anything. Um, fourth thing is hire for what you need in three months. From uh, hire now what you need three months from now because what you guys probably don't know yet um, is that by the time you need someone it's already too late because guess what it's going to take you three to six months to find the person who doesn't suck and then it's going to probably take you a few weeks of back and forth if they're a senior hire and then it's going to take them two weeks to quit their job and then it's going to take you know another three weeks for them to ramp and the problem is when you're a startup <coughs> that you basically just sacrifice your hockey stick. Like there goes your hockey stick this year cuz like the three people who are going to get you that growth, you're like 6 months behind. So like good luck doing that. Um, I mean Parker was looking Parker was looking at a 100,000 square foot office when we were only 40 people. I mean for context that's like enough to fit like a few thousand people. <laughs> and I was like, "Dude, you are absolutely crazy." And it's cuz he had the foresight to know that if if he had waited, like he's basically screwed. Um and then the last thing is marketing is a rolling stone. So like all of you guys here, you should you should not just be thinking of like what is the one way. Uh, what was the company who was doing the um, the concierge service? Yeah. Scout. Like Scout, the, the the idea that we spoke about that should be like one of fifty ideas. Um, and what you should be doing is testing that right away. And as soon as there's even like a flicker of a flame, throwing fire on it and moving to like the next one. Because um, <clears throat> by the time again, it's it's kind of kind of goes back to the hockey stick thing. By the time you need exponential growth again, it's already too late um, because you haven't been thinking about the 50 other levers in the meantime. And that, that's like these five things I've, I've really fucked up along the way, but I've learned from them. And it's why we're able to grow so fast because um, I've, I've kind of learned these lessons. Um, so that's, that's it. Um, I hope, that was, I know it's very B2B SaaS focused. And I know some of you guys are not B2B, but I think um, there's definitely a few of you in here who this definitely does apply to, and so I hope I hope you learned from it. And I guess, do you want to open it up to Q and A's? Yeah. Well, oh. yeah. Okay. So, um, how did you get the 500 people to uh, come and be in person? How did you get, acquire all the people to come in person to your event? You said that sounded crazy, and then all of a sudden, it's multiplied by 500. Uh. Uh, by the way, Michael, if you have to go, feel free to. Um, yeah, the 500 people, uh, we ended up doing. Um, <clears throat> we ended up doing a lot of marketing automation and a lot of um, and a lot of really cool ways. Um, so, for instance, we did. Uh, we ended up doing an HTML um, an HTML invite, which then automatically forwarded from the account manager that looked like the account management was like personally reaching out to everyone, being like, "Hey, did you get this thing?" Um, we did a lot of actually native advertising and some like really very creative PPC things um, to actually target prospects. So like literally like a bus, if we if you were in our tracking pixel, we would we'd like fill up every ad space and like a bus would drive across your screen and it would be like rolling out the future of HR. Um, so we just did you know we did we did things I had not planned on doing. Let's just let's just put it that way. I I, I just started thinking like we'll email our customers. That's basically it. <laughs> I mean, it went it went way beyond that. How how much of 
growth do you think is really um, perfecting marketing via email? Um, I, I think email is just so perfect because it's so measurable and it, it's so testable. So I don't think there's anything inherently awesome about email. Um, it just happens to be the perfect lab for testing marketing. Um, is kind of how I think about it. What and you didn't mention much about social, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Any of those things work for Zenefits, or how do you look at those as a SaaS company? Uh, so we do zero. <laughs> um, now I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. Um, it could totally be the right thing for your company. In fact, we're we're hiring a social media person as we speak. Um, so we're going to be doing it. It's just when you're going for hockey stick, um, it, this goes back to the why I think you should ask your growth guy, like what are the first three things you do? If he tells you show, social, he's almost 100% wrong. <laughs> almost guaranteed wrong. Because um, there's no way if you're trying to like 50x that you're going to be able to do it through like a bunch of tweets and Facebook posts. Now there's like, vi there's like viral products, which is not to be mistaken, where it's like Instagram, like you join and then it like posts to like 50 friends on Facebook, social totally works. But when you're a B2B SaaS company, it's a little hard to sell to social people over tweets. Um, okay, questions from the audience, go ahead. Microphone. So to be back off of the social um, in the B2B space, have you- Into the microphone, yep. Have you leveraged uh, like LinkedIn advertising or anything uh, yeah. on the paid LinkedIn side? So LinkedIn is, is interesting. Um, I, in fact, I, I don't even know if I consider LinkedIn I, I think of social honesty as like Twitter and Facebook and all this stuff. LinkedIn is kind of like the holy grail for marketers, at least B2B marketers, because there's a lot of, it's like everything's perfect and up to date because it's their career and they want to put their, their best face forward. Um, and it's, it's essentially just a giant database of everyone you want to talk to. So it's, it's fascinating. I think their ad products have a lot of room to grow, um, but we definitely play on LinkedIn and I think it's, I would, I, if I were you, I would definitely test it right away. If you're in like a B2B setting. What things did you do before you hit product market fit? And then how did you know when you hit product market fit? Um, so the product market fit, uh, I think it goes back to what I did for the first three months. Um, which is why I think you guys should do it and why I also gave you those metrics that show you, or at least I think give you a good gauge of whether or not you have product market fit. Cause is that, is that me? No. no. Um, um, cause, because from what, what, what happens is the guy, the guy who's doing all that testing, he should also be the one scheduling the demos for himself and should also be the one hopping on the sales call himself and should also be the one closing the deal himself. So this guy or girl has literally seen the entire funnel and knows, and knows it works. Um, and, and it was literally me and Parker doing that funnel for three months. Um, and so we... Yeah. Walking down the conveyor belt before you flip it on. Exactly. And you're making sure like this this part of the conveyor belt works, then you're moving to the next part and then the next part. And that's how you know when you, you have product market fit, because the conveyor belt just moves along the line and doesn't like blow up. Yeah, we, I mean, we reached out, so we reached out to a lot of people in our own networks, but it's, it's essentially just Gmail. Just straight up, one-on-one, -on -one boring emails. <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no questions of like deliverability, open rate, like what you don't want to do is muddy up your sample. So if you're doing, which you should not be doing anyway, like, you know, 10,000 like MailChimp sends, um, then you may have like a high spam rate, in which case, did it not work because your message sucked or did it not work because you had a high bounce back rate? No. Now they do. I, we don't use them, but it's they they're essentially, you know, they're kind of trying to automate what I think we did manually. Has anybody tried those in here? Any of those three? And what are the experiences been? It's nice and loud. Um outreach that I was really expensive, about twelve hundred dollars a year. Outreach that I was really expensive, it's about twelve hundred dollars a year. 
Um, probably not the best bet, but it connects really well with Salesforce. There's another startup uh, called Persist IQ that's about fifty dollars a month. Um, which Persist is all, IQ. Yeah, and these both send through email. It won't look like you're sending from Mailchimp or anything like that. Um, I've used it perfectly fine uh, for about ten thousand emails so far, and I only had one that mounts. Um, and I've been getting about thirty percent response rate, which has been working really well. Uh, yeah, I really love Persist IQ. That sounds pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh oh. Don't is this on is this on camera? I don't know if they're gonna like that. <laughs> Everyone's gonna be knocking on their door tomorrow. We were doing it very manually, trying to we have what we call seven by seven. Seven dungeons in seven days? Yes. Wow, that is a that is four. aggressive. I'm sorry, three emails and four phone calls. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. That's that's yeah. That makes sense. And, and on day seven it's like a breakup email. Yeah. It, it, it just automates that process. So I have just automatically generate the chat, so you want. And it breaks up at the end of seven, like you're not gonna email you again. Well, no, we say we're gonna email and then we put on the strip campaign. Do you have people who work with the soft? Um, so we, our industry, I think it's just the title that we call on in our industry, they're not getting a lot of sales calls. So if we get somebody on the phone, we actually have around just under 50% conversion rate for demo. Wow. Like incredibly high. That's like crazy high. I mean, if that's true, then you're going to do very well. So we, yeah, no. That's and assuming there's a lot of those guys out there. We might be the only sales call that gets that call because of who we're calling. Well, it sure it shows the three competitors in the product stock. It's not like they're releasing new products. Yeah, no. pretty cool. Very fortunate. If you imagine if you're a local business, how many people are trying to reach a local drive center pizzeria yeah. where you know everybody? I've done it for very competitive businesses, and that's not very good at all. How um, competitive is it for dentists? When you're calling, is there are people slamming the founders about HR solutions? Um, no, people are, I mean, there's a, listen, there's always going to be people who say, fuck you. I'm, I mean, honestly, me, when SDRs call me, I'm like, fuck you, I'm busy, hang up. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, that's not most people. So most people, they'll like very, they'll very impatiently give you, you know, if you say, hey, so the whole trick is for an SDR, it's to be very slow and almost awkward. Like, hey, Jane, it's, uh, it's Matt. Do you, do you have a second? And then, then they're like, yeah, I have. I, what is this about? And the, the whole thing about that email and that and like the marketing guy who really figures out a, a strong way to package and sell your thing is that you have like ten seconds to like really talk to someone and compel them to act. Um, and so I think I'm very fortunate in that I could honestly probably be pretty shitty at my job and still do well here. Uh, it's the only thing that does this. It solves a real pain point. It's free. There's no contracts, and it works with all your current systems, so there's no friction. Um, so it's very, I think, outside of the initial, the, there's the people who hate cold calling and then everyone else who like will give you a chance. I think if you get a chance, most people are not upset because they're like, oh, that, like, I would really like to solve that pain. Um, so, so the answer is no. In general, it's not like, we don't have like a thousand person call center with like half the United States angry at us. <laughs> Yeah, so so the pressure thing was probably uh, a little gratuitous. Um, so I don't I don't like really make it my goal to make someone crack. Um, <clears throat> but you know, some people lighten up when they when they kind of like see someone getting a little comfortable. Whereas I think if you're going to be a salesperson you are going to get the fuck offs. And so you, that person does have to have a strong character. Um, so like one way of doing that is digging into their numbers. So a lot of people, you know, what was, okay, what was your quota? What was your conversion rate? You know, blah, 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 blah. And you go down the chain and people, like, they either know it or they don't. And if they pretend to know it and you really hammer on it, they'll then like, well, wait a second. You told me you had a 3% conversion rate. So how did you hit a quota of X? And then they just kind of like fall apart. Um, 
And then the take home test is basically, hey, I need you, like, pretend you are the CEO of a company. Um, so this is what we do for Zenefits. Pretend you are the CEO of Zenefits and you are emailing me. Um, how would you, like, sell me, just give me, sell me over email? Um, and people are just, like, inherently good salespeople, um, or they're not. Um, they're just kind of born with it. But honestly, the bigger filter is you have no idea, no freaking clue how many people have grammar errors, typos. Um, they don't follow the instructions. And it's like this natural, it's, it, it's honestly, uh, it's like Darwinism. It, it's like all the species that weren't meant to be around just like die off in the very beginning. <laughs> because it's like, dude, if you can't, if, you know, you'd be shocked how many, how, like, how many people you may have hired who couldn't even like spell right. Um, we've we've done that now, just because of like crazy numbers. But in the very beginning, um, I would speak to someone, and if I liked them, I'd say, "Great, here's your take-home test." And if they passed that, I'd hire them. Um, there's been some people who've kind of like, like you know, they've they've kind of like huffed and puffed, and those people I just immediately axed. Because the people you want in your startup are the people who's like, fuck yes, give me a writing test. Like, give me like 10 writing tests. You know what I mean? You don't want the guy who's like shopping around to 40 companies and like he's sighing because like this is the 10th take home test he has to do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, two questions. Okay. Will you be sharing the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, sure. Thank you. Second is in the. Your success metric for SDR, the last point was between 5K slash 80. What's that? Was which, which number? The success metric. 55 slash 80. Oh, uh, like I think a, a question people have is like, what do you, like what is like kind of like the average? So I think like a, like a high paying job, a high paying SDR is like 55, 80. That, that, that's, like a, that's like a high paying SDR. So just if you guys were in trying you know, to get SDRs, like what, what does like the market call for? I was just trying to give you some guidance on that. That's their full time salary? It, it's, it's commission, so it's like oh, it's base commission. and commission. Oh, yeah. Got it. Sorry. Okay, got it. All right, thank you. Yeah. Just curious, what was your most creative marketing hack that you? Uh, unfortunately, as much as I want to do it for you guys, I have a lot. But to, to Jason's point, it's about winning. And so, like, here, here's the truth. Here's why, like, secrecy and privacy is honestly of the utmost importance. You would be shocked. In rooms like this, where if I told you guys, in a month, it would be on, like, a blog post, and the entire marketing community would know about it. And guess what? Like, that really awesome idea you had, everyone's doing it. Um, so, There's a shop left, right? Yeah, there really is. And that's why when I talk about levers, um, it, you're, you, the, it'll, it'll run out. Um, and that's why you need 30 other levers to pull. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Well done. Thanks. Thanks so much.